um, and thanks for joining us today for our workshop on digital annotation, handy tools for research. Um, so today we're just going to cover a, a couple of different tools that are really useful for doing image research. Um, and we want to start with right a, a historical and prehistorical practice in theory that's um, going to be brought to you by Chris. Um, also, we're going to do some demos. Um, Chris is going to mostly lead those demos uh, for a couple of different particular tools that allow you to do this kind of annotation on images that's really helpful for research. And then we'll also have some time at the end for questions and any kind of reflections or um, sort of feedback that you have on your that you might need for your particular projects. Um, and so we'll get started with some introductions to kick things off. Um, I'm Francesca Albrezzi. I'm digital research specialist um, and a manager of our uh, research uh, uh, technology group for GIS and visualization in the Office of Advanced Research Computing at UCLA. And really my role is to support faculty research, digital research specifically. I'm also currently serving as the acting vice chair for the digital humanities program. Um, and I sometimes teach for my old department, World Arts and Culture slash Dance, um, where I did my dissertation work. Um, some other things that I do, other hats I wear, I'm the editor in chief of the International Journal of Digital Art History. I also run their virtual gallery. Um, I'm a co-chair of the education committee for the College Art Association. And um, I'm affiliated with groups like Art History Teaching Resources and the Women in Technology, um, the UC Women in Technology group. Um, so my expertise really lies in extended reality technologies. And what I mean by that um, are things like this, which you're seeing on the screen now. Um, so I'm specifically interested in spectrums of immersive experience as offered by technologies such as virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, you're probably familiar with a number of these, but also 360 photo and video capture as well. That's where I really started. Um, because what I'm, what I'm interested in terms of this extended reality technology, right, or XR technologies that sometimes refer to is the idea of context, right? And um, you're seeing some of my equipment here on the screen that I use um, to do this kind of work. Um, but it's, it's really about thinking about how uh, this, this technology can offer greater context, um, whether we're thinking about publication, information capture, or display. Um, so that really shifting the epistemologies of um, arts and culture by offering greater contextualized information. Um, and I think that's what these technologies can do. They can help shift that paradigm. Um, and I'm also really interested in technology supporting teaching and learning. And so that's why I often work with Chris. Um, and so I will pass it over to Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Chris Gilman. I'm Digital Curriculum Program Coordinator, coordinator with the UCLA Library, Digital Library Program. Uh, my own background is in Slavic languages and literatures, um, and um, things like the Russian avant-garde, early 20th century um, experimentation in cinema, architecture, theater design, brain science, and the like. Um, uh, I've been doing um, something that is has always been sort of DH adjacent, um, which is um, what was one's called multimedia literacy, and uh, in many ways have continued that work um, here at, um, uh, at UCLA. Um, I support the integration of digital collections, tools, and practices uh, in the UCLA curriculum, um, and have been working especially um, uh, in designing in innovative curriculum, uh, using Brew and Learn, and uh, all kinds of embedded tools and systems. So we're gonna look at a number of those today. But just as sort of a note, um, uh, Francesca mentioned our kind of complementary and overlapping uh, interests and perspectives. 
um, Francesca is um, uh, sort of um, responsible for thinking about research um, and particularly research at the highest uh, levels. Um, my interest in research um, centers around inquiry in the curriculum. So most of the things that I, um, I address or I'm concerned with have to do with either entry level kinds of research tools and systems uh, or tools and systems uh, that have some kind of applicability um, in, uh, in the undergraduate curriculum. So one of the most important concerns uh, of my work in this role um, is an approach to instruction and curriculum design um, that I call collections-based learning, which seeks to make effective instructional use of collections as finite sets of typologically similar items of inquiry, like this set, um, this, um, set of patent medicine trade cards. You can see one uh, on the screen. Um, they're, um, they are both physical and digital um, in, uh, in their existence. Um, and that kind of duality in and of itself is a, is a challenging thing to address uh, in the curriculum. But I'd say probably the most difficult or challenging um, uh, matter is figuring out how to sequence learning activities that engage these types of materials. Um, so today we're gonna to consider one of the most central and effective digital proficiencies in this work, which is annotation. Um, and from my perspective, which focuses on uh, research as inquiry-based education, annotation serves as a kind of a linchpin between many other kinds of scholarly practices, such as argumentation, citation, curation of evidence, and publication. So for today's workshop, we're gonna focus on a couple of digital tools for visual annotation starting with a few entry level examples, such as stories and exhibits, uh, exhibit, um, and uh, moving up um, the sort of research grade taxonomy toward Mirador, a IIIF compatible compa um, a comparative viewing tool for digital collections. Uh, we're gonna look at versions two and three, um, and uh, then move to Scalar, um, a multimedia authoring and publication platform, um, and, uh, and wind up with Tropy. Um, uh, along the way, uh, we'll note some shifts and overlaps between types of research from student-centered introductory inquiry and courses to advanced individual and social methods and practices where annotation may serve as a step toward understanding and it may figure as an important aspect of scholarly communication. So to wrap our heads around annotation and its digital expression as an aspect of visual media, text and relational data using 21st century tools and platforms, it may help to ground us in historical, perhaps prehistorical examples. And you'll have to bear with my sense of humor here. Um, so here on, uh, on our Zoom screens, uh, we see what can be reasonably described as a prototype of annotation. That is a scribbly marginal note made by a reader at some point in a printed book. And you can see down in the bottom right hand corner. Um, if this were a library book, we might at first find it annoying or a distraction from our own engagement with the original text, at the very least a defacing public property. Um, if it were in a used bookstore on Amazon, it might lower the resale value. Annotations according to that prototype are enhancements made to a base document by a reader. And as such, they enrich our understanding of things uh, that happen after the creation of the original. But annotations even of the same sort of categorical sort can also fundamentally change our understanding of an original by revealing dimensions or elements of information that were presumed knowledge and, there, and thereby inherent to the original text. For example, Dryden's Absalom and Achitophel from 1681 was an encoded poem uh, written during a turbulent period of the English Restoration when open expression of political sentiments could get you murdered or executed. The key to decoding the published work was shared in person, likely at a coffee house or a pub, and annotated in the relatively relative safety of one's own library. Only later 
is it revealed as evidence of significance? Such is the impetus for the intentional curation of a so-called artificial collection of early modern annotated books on Calisphere derived from items held at our own UCLA Clark Memorial Library. Artificial in this sense indicates that the physical books that comprise this selective digital collection aren't themselves organized at the library as a distinct collection. This collection was digitized and made publicly available online as a collaborative project of UCLA's digital library program, where I work, and the Clark Library with the support of an NEH grant. The, the grant application makes reference to scholarship about annotation, and it provides characteristic examples of annotations within the collection that might be of value to researchers. The fact that it is digitized and made openly available as research data enables advanced 21st century methods of analysis. And one early experiment with AI technology conducted now several years ago by um, the, the, the digital library program's Don Childress fed the whole collection as a corpus to a machine learning process to identify and distinguish handwritten annotations from printed text. So not to get too meta about this, um, but here's an interesting artifact that enfolds both senses of annotation, historical and digital, in one place. It's a digital annotation by a student in a UCLA course project on the historical annotation we just looked at on a previous slide. These are two screenshots from a scalar site which display the detail of a page imported as media with a pop-up annotation by the student containing a, trans, a transcription of the messy handwriting, as well as a thoughtful interpretation of what it might have meant in that context. Okay. So, um, so what is annotation? Just a little bit of, about the sort of abstract theory. Um, one helpful way to think about uh, annotation, especially given the proliferation of annotation tools, and the deep historical roots is to look at the W3C definition and diagram. The, the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C, um, is the main international standards organization for the World Wide Web. This diagram helps account for a wide range of practices and it visually abstracts the phenomenon to a relational structure. Um, and let's see if we can read. Um, uh, an annotation is considered to be a set of connected resources, typically including a body and target, and conveys that the body is related to the target. The exact nature of this relationship changes according to the intention of the annotation, but the body is most frequently um, somehow about the target. This perspective results in a basic model with three parts. Look at those three there. So the innocuous pastel colors and shapes help it achieve a kind of algebraic neutrality where values are not specified. Unlike our familiar historical textual prototype of marginal notes by a reader in a printed book, an annotation here can be made up of other things such as two images related to each other or perhaps a 3D scan and a video clip. Of course, no representation is ever completely neutral, nor is language arbitrary. When I see the W3C diagram, I'm reminded of Nico Wafers, um, an old-fashioned candy that would appear in my trick-or-treat bag um, at Halloween when I was a kid. It's dusty, chalky quality, took you back in time like eating a history lesson. So Nico Wafers, were invented or introduced in 1847. Uh, they saw service in, World War, in, uh, in the Civil War and they're really awful, but they also give us sort of a glimpse into the past. So where am I going with all of this? In and of themselves, each color's flavor could hardly be identified as much more than chalk, but eating them in quick succession revealed meaningful comparative differences. And I arrived at a kind of dialectic where yellow wafers figured it as a kind of synthesis between antithetical flavors, purple and pink. And um, 
after years of eating Nico wafers, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that they were clove, wintergreen, and lemon. The, the, the flavors uh, had very little relation to the, um, uh, to the colors. Or to take things um, back even earlier in history to prehistory, um, before writing, before humans even existed, we can find close analogs in annotation to annotation and paleo paleontological research. For example, um, here a publication highlights with visual annotation the relational significance of a find inside of a fossilized hadrosaur tailbone, a T. rex tooth fragment that had lodged inside the tailbone and then further and then enveloped um, and then was enveloped through healing and further growth. This is evidence that T. rex was indeed a predator and not only a scavenger. More essentially, the finding tells us not just about the central qualities of either beast, but of their habits, ways of life, tastes, perhaps, and traumas, depending on who, who you ask. That is, in other words, a much richer field of evidence and knowledge that might come from singular and not relational information. So if we revisit the W3C model, we can see how closely conformed these two contexts really are. An annotation is considered to be a set of connected resources, or the predation model, predation is considered a subset of feeding behavior by which any species kills what it eats, and blah, blah, blah. What we, what we learn, in other words, um, is that data or information in an annotation is a recording of the connection between things rather than um, any um, bit of data in and of itself. Okay. So let's see how let's see how we make this work. Okay. So we're going to start um, with a. Uh, kind of fluid, elegant, and I'd say entry-level uh, tool called Stories. Okay, so this is Stories. Um, it's a um, it's a lightweight um, triple IF compliant um, uh, application by a company called Cogap. Um, it has the um, a lovely quality of engaging triple IF. Um, deep zooming that capability. Um, for anybody who doesn't um, know what IIIF uh, is or what it stands for, I'll say very quickly, it's an acronym for the International Image Interoperability Framework. Um, and it's a standard for image delivery over the web that is, it, um, that is adhered to by many cultural heritage institutions, including uh, the UCLA Library. Um, and um, it has several um, Sort of specific qualities. One is um, rapid delivery of high resolution uh, images. Um, and another is interoperable content, which means that content um, from our institution can be used um, alongside content from, uh, let's say, uh, Harvard's Digital Library, Library of Congress, um, uh, the Bodleian Library at Oxford, uh, and so on. So, um, we are looking here at a, um, at a stories um, interface that is embedded in a Brew and Learn content page. And it has a relatively simple functionality of, um, of captions um, associated with any particular um, view in the, in the image. So I'm gonna go here and Click open the stories uh, editor. Edit the story. I'm going to zoom in to a This is a, a this is a um, map from the 
uh, mid 16th century in the region of what is now uh, Mexico City. Um, and it, it has a lot of interesting pictographic um, uh, information, uh, including land holdings and, um, and evidence of uh, early use of grafting um, uh, in, uh, in agriculture. So I'm just gonna make a comment here about um, plots of land were mapped out and counted. Really know what I'm saying here. I'm gonna move over. Here, add new. Here we see many examples of plants that were cultivated through grafting. European hops onto indigenous rootstock. Yeah. And then maybe zoom in a little bit more to one of my favorite little images. You can see there's a little hidden face. Um, drafting as and for the appearance of a face of the plant suggests that he saw. saw Drafting as not only a practice, but a kind of belief. Again, bear with me. I'm really not sure what I'm saying here with all of these. But so you see the process, it's really quite easy. And then we can preview. So here is a full screen um, output of this um, uh, quickly annotated image, where if I click on the advance, it'll take me to that portion of the image that I was looking at. and. Um, and it will show my caption here, which serves effectively as an annotation of that portion of the image. Okay, so that's really quite a simple and uh, an easy um, tool. I'd say it's very effective for communication and it also serves uh, nicely as a kind of uh, pedagogical tool. Um, okay, so um, now we're going to um, hop over to um, a similar uh, tool called um, Exhibit. It has the same basic function, um, but it's a little bit uh, more robust. Um, we've uh, set up uh, one with a with an embedded example from the. Uh, Nemazine, uh, which created this tool. You can click uh, through and see um, a slideshow, zoom in, zoom out, show additional uh, items. So it has um, a far more robust um, capability um, than, uh, than stories, um, but it lacks some of its uh, immediacy and um, I'd say fluid motion uh, and accessibility. So I'm going to um, kind of demo 
um, a process by which we've used exhibit um, in a classroom um, with the patent medicine trade cards, for example. Um, we've got a collection manifest here, and I'm going to arbitrarily um, pick one with cute um, animals in them. Um, and uh, from here, um, select a IIIF manifest, which I'm going to copy from right down here. Um, and then I'm going to go into the uh, exhibit editor. Okay, so exhibits ask that I uh, load the item uh, once I'm into the project. So I'm going to paste my manifest in, click import. Okay, I'm going to add it to my exhibit. Side. Puppies. Yeah. Okay, so the operation is similar, but a bit, um, oops, a bit more complicated. Okay. Um, so I'm going to something first about and for us and for us had to rely on Puppies to sell their suspicious goods. Right. Um, and then you can see that they also have some additional. Um, editing capacity, but heading to, you can put in a link and other things that you can't do with, um, uh, with stories. Um, and 
So with similar kind of process, um, you can create a, um, a kind of moving um, uh, sequential analysis or story or narrative um, using the basic function of, um, of annotation of image details. Okay. Any thoughts or comments about, um, about exhibit? All right. So I should say again, um, uh, exhibit allows you to put in multiple items. It allows you to use um, whole manifests. Um, uh, that is, uh, let's say, an illuminated manuscript um, or, or, or a, um, uh, a triple IF resource that has uh, multiple images within it. It can handle all that relatively easily. Um, it's more robust as an authoring tool. Um, it makes a great presentation tool. It, it embedded in, um, in a Bruin Learn site. It can also be used as a kind of uh, mini lecture or teaching resource. Um, and it does work well with student projects, but it requires a little bit more handholding um, and care working with the students to make sure that they're able to, uh, to follow all the directions because it's not quite as user-friendly um, and, um, and sort of um, guardrailed as, uh, as stories. Okay. Any other comments or I'll move on to, uh, to Mirador and annotations there. Okay. So uh, in the IIIF world, um, uh, Mirador is one of the um, two leading um, viewing um, platforms. Um, the other is the Universal Viewer. Mirador is designed um, uh, largely with scholars in mind because it allows you to, um, to uh, import and view multiple items from multiple sources in the same field simultaneously. Um, it is um, equipped with annotation capacity um, in principle, um, both with Mirador 2 and uh, Mirador 3. So Mirador 3 is replacing Mirador 2. However, there, uh, there have been some, uh, I'd say, challenges and complications with using annotation in Mirador 3. And so the, the developer community of Mirador 3 is sort of catching up to where they were with Mirador 2. So I have an instance here of Mirador 2 that can demonstrate what uh, annotations looks and feels like um, in, this, uh, in this medium. And you can see some of the same qualities that um, stories or exhibits have with the deep zooming uh, IIIF uh, content, but there are certain things that are gained and, and lost in, in comparison. So here um, I preloaded a, um, uh, the Codex Mendoza, which is a Mesoamerican uh, manuscript. I'm going to click through a few pages. Actually, I'll slide through. That way. Um, again, it has uh, a lovely kind of mix of graphic um, and text. Um, this is one of my favorites. You can zoom in, zoom out, and uh, really sort of see it in all of its glory um, with uh, the triple IF um, media. This is from the Bodleian Library um, at Oxford in their digital collections. And by IIIF, we're simply importing it or bringing it into uh, this viewer that we have um, it, uh, embedded in an iframe in our, um, in our Bruin Learn Canvas uh, site. So I click through here, find an item that I uh, particularly like, and um, and I'm going to annotate it. Um, and you can see up here in the uh, upper left-hand corner, the little speech bubbles indicate an annotation tool. And it gives um, a set of options. And with each one, um, uh, also choices in how thin or thick to make the line, um, the color of the line, um, and the fill, if, if you so choose. Um, I'm sort of... Uh, I favor uh, a rectangle. And as I do that, it 
gives me a little pop-up window um, and it's somewhat robust in that it, it allows me to format and to add links, to add media, um, and also to add tags. If I had a, a linked image, I could add it to my uh, to my little tag here. Um, again, I'm not a specialist, but um, but I do know that the writing of Nahuatl, Nahuatl came uh, after the Spanish conquest, but um, uh, but uh, remnants of the pictographic language continued on um, for a very long time. Um, so I'm going to save my uh, annotation, uh, and there it is. And it um, and it should remain there um, as I go through my document. Right. And there it is. Anybody else reading this um, who has uh, a similar or related instance of uh, of this mirador um, uh, to um, our reader will be able to see this. So, uh, so if you're to create uh, an annotation on this uh, same item, and again, we can put the uh, let's see, put this in chat. So you should be able to um, similarly go through, open up, look at it, um, and, um, and add an annotation here. And we should all be able to, say, to see each other's annotations. So, so how does this compare with, um, with stories, for example? Um, for one thing, the annotation sits in the content, so it doesn't provide its own navigation strategies. It's based on um, a, a kind of close analysis of the object itself. And so the logic of navigation, of reading, and so forth follows the logic of reading a, a book or a codex in this case, rather than having the, the narrative carried forward, forward uh, as in stories or exhibits. Um, that makes it a little bit more difficult for student use, um, especially if you have a, a, a long multi-volume set or something like that, annotations are likely to go in and, um, and get lost. Um, uh, so uh, similarly, um, the, um, the storage of, uh, of the annotations themselves and, uh, and the functionality of this tool, um, uh, Mirador 2, it was sort of designed around um, uh, the, the understanding of scholars uh, in a field being able to enhance the, the, um, the metadata or the value of, um, of collections items um, through a, a, a rather controlled process. Um, but there was also sort of a vision of kind of crowdsourcing um, uh, knowledge and there's this very fuzzy kind of unclear line between what is desired information that would be annotated and uh, essentially attached to the original images and annotations that might, like in, this, in the example of students, be better managed or controlled um, in, a, in an annotation server or an environment that is disconnected from, uh, from the original. So in this case, 
the, um, the instance of Mirador 2 is coming from, uh, from Princeton uh, with colleagues of ours. Um, and, we share, um, and we share this instance uh, largely for experimental purposes. Um, uh, if any unit um, uh, like an institution um, and so forth um, uh, 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 is interested in having their own uh, annotation set up um, uh, and, uh, with a server and so forth, that's the kind of project that we're interested in supporting. That's something that OARC, the Digital Library Program, and others um, would be um, would be very in interested in sort of helping to to facilitate. Um, okay, so that's Mirador two. Um, any um, thoughts or questions uh, about that one, or we'll um, move on to three. Okay, so as so as I mentioned, Mirador T three succeeds Mirador two. It's um, in some ways uh, cleaner. Um, it's um, far more powerful as a um, as a viewing tool. It has lots of lots of advantages. Um, but annotations as a function um, uh, are not built into the viewer. Um, they need to be added as a plugin to the instance uh, of, um, of Mirador that you're, that you're using. And, uh, and you need to, to have a, an annotation server specially set up and so forth. We don't have that. So I'm borrowing um, a, a, a kind of demo uh, site for um, Mirador 3 with annotations. Um, and uh, you can see um, that um, there are already a number of annotations that are put here by various um, uh, artificial intelligence um, services at Amazon Web Services and others that are um, identifying, let's say, emotional attributes or other things um, on uh, Van Gogh's self-portrait. Um, but we can um, add an annotation of our own. Uh, again, making selections of what um, size and um, thickness of the line, a fill, if if uh, if if not. And I'm just going to go ahead and say something about the ear. Oh, here. Always had it in for his ear. Okay. Put it. Okay, there it is. And here's my annotation added in to uh, all the bots. And so, again, Mirador 3 has lots of desirable qualities. Um, the ability to um, view things side by side. Let's see if I still have a, a manifest I can load. Okay, and so here is our other item. Get rid of Van Gogh. Find a page that we like. Annotation. Okay, and there it is. Right, and so this is 
going to be um, stored in my uh, Francesca's uh, cache. Um, if we refresh, um, it's likely to be lost. Um, so we get to, to see this, use it for demo purposes basically only. Um, if we were to have a, um, uh, an instance again of, of Mirador 3 with, uh, with an annotation server, then this would be um, uh, a robust tool that we could use, uh, let's say for close analysis of the, these types of resources and for keeping track of our own uh, kind of research inquiry as as we um, as we move through uh, collections of materials. So I'll move on um, and uh, and do uh, one more before we um, pass it along to Francesca. This is um, Scalar. Um, Scalar is a um, multimedia um, authoring platform that allows you to um, embed rich media content into long form text um, with metadata. Um, and use uh, resources that are linked from uh, cultural heritage institutions and other web-based resources. It has been relatively recently um, updated to include IIIF compatibility, so you can import items from IIIF um, uh, uh, digital collections. Um, and um, on individual pages, uh, you can add annotations the way that you can uh, with other images uh, or with uh, video clips and sound files and so forth. All right, so I'm gonna, um, again, hop out of uh, Scalar. Uh, I'm a brew and learn to show you a, a sample Scalar page. So this is, um, this is a single page with some dummy lorem ipsum text in it. Um, and it has one embedded image in it already. I'm gonna go into that image uh, and annotate it and demonstrate um, some of the, the core idea of the W3C standard, which is to make a connection between two items. All right, so I'll start with um, the uh, image itself. So this is its own discrete page in Scalar. Um, and in the toolbar across the top, you can see the annotation tool, which is a paperclip. And that pulls up a, um, uh, a distinctive uh, interface. And I'm going to select this image right here and suggest that this is a self-portrait by Vesalius um, in his anatomy. Elias was an artist in ways. Save my annotation. And there you can see it. I'm going to do one more thing. So in Scalar, everything is a thing, and an annotation is also its own page. So I'm going to edit that page. I'm going to add a little bit of media here. So this is a scalar page. Um, I had an image of Vesalius that I also cropped out of um, the triple IF based um, uh, anatomy in the Library of Congress. And so now we have um, this uh, image and this image. And I want to get back to the main image here, which now in our pop-up allows us to make a direct connection between um, a portion of an image, a bit of text, 
and another image. So in that sense, it fundamentally realizes the W3C um, underlying idea of an annotation is not simply being comments about uh, a thing or marginal notes, but actually a, a data relationship that is um, uh, established in a scalar book um, between two pieces of, of media. Okay. So, lots of questions about um, about scalar. Okay. So then, perhaps we can move on to uh, to trophy. Sure. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, these tools are just absolutely phenomenal, and really can change the way that we teach, but also the way that we store information. Um, you know, when we're thinking about doing this kind of close looking research. Um, I'm just going to quickly switch over back to the presentation that we have here. Um, so Tropy is a free and open source desktop software that allows you to organize and describe photographs or really any image research material that you might have. Um, once you've imported those images um, into Tropy, you can combine different images um, into items. So for example, photos of three different pages, right, of a letter can then be combined into a single item. So this is really helpful if you're thinking about archival research, right, and going into the archives and documenting what you're doing there, what you're looking at and thinking about folios and all of that, and then being able to store that in a way when you leave there, that keeps things grouped together. Um, you can also describe the content of those things. Um, so Tropy uses customizable metadata templates with multiple fields for different properties of the content. Um, and for example, things like title, date, author, box maybe, right? What, what specific box you um, found it in within the particular collection, the folder, the collection itself, um, even the archive, right? So all of that can be detailed within Tropy through these fields. And you can enter information in the template for uh, an individual photo or select multiple images at the same time and add and edit that information all at once um, in bulk, which is really, really helpful, right? When you maybe have done multiple stints in different boxes or things like that, but you just wanna have the same information throughout, that becomes very quick and easy when using Tropy. Um, Tropy also lets you tag images, so you can add one or multiple notes as well. Um, and this is just really helpful in terms of organizing your research notes, right? And how you wanna think about this information for your particular project. Um, and in terms of the notes feature as well, they really were thinking about transcription or tra transcription and translation. So the notes feature can, I'll show you in a minute, be used as a way to do side-by-side -side sort of research in that way. And a search function does allow you to find material in your, in your um, images using that metadata, those tags and notes really quickly. So again, you can think, you know, it, how many possible images you might have for a project, right? Well, if you need to call up something very quickly, as long as you use the search feature, that's possible. And then finally, you can export the um, as JSON um, LD, as a CSV file, or as a PDF, if you wanna share your organ organized material. Um, so, What's different about Tropy than from what Chris has been showing is that Tropy is a desktop application and it works with all open source, um, or I said all operating systems, so Linux, Mac, and Windows, which is really useful. Um, it's also produced by an international team of historians and software developers. I think what's important just to note here is that, you know, it was originally created by the Roy uh, Rosenzweig uh, Center for History and New Media. 
Um, and today it's jointly developed by the RRCH NM and the um, Luxembourg Center for Contemporary and Digital History, so um, C2DH and Digital Scholar, um, which is a not for profit corporation which operates uh, allied projects such as Zotero, which you've probably heard of, Omeka, and Sorcery. So I think really. Um, What's important here is that it has backing from the field and in involvement of people who've been doing this for a very long time, right? It's funded by the, the Mellon Foundation. It's a, it's a tool that is meant to be used by a lot of different people doing this type of research um, and has really had that sort of backing behind it the whole way. Um, so it's very solid. Um, some things to note that Tropy is not. Um, I think as much as it's useful to know what it is, it's also helpful to know what it can't do, right? So Tropy is not a photo editing software, really. It can do a, a certain level, right? It has basic editing for rotating, cropping, zooming, and a few other things. You can change the saturation, saturation and things like that. Um, so things that are sufficient to allow you to make um, the content of the image more legible but it's not going to be Photoshop, right? Um, and you'll um, it won't won't make any changes to the original images that you bring in. So you can save a copy of those photos and make those changes to that. Um, Tropy's not a citation manager. So I mentioned Zotero earlier. There's a lot of similarities between Tropy and Zotero, but it's not for um, citation management. It doesn't capture metadata from online catalogs. Um, or finding aids in the same way that Zotero does, right? Um, it does not generate citations for word processing software, so you can't export things out in that same way um, in a specific format for citation. But that being said, it still does have those fielded um, uh, metadata that can be exported, so you can think about how these things might be mapped in a useful way. Um, it's not a web application, right? As I mentioned earlier, that does it just exists on your desktop. So I'm going to show that to you in a minute. Um, but development is underway to allow collaboration on the web. So that's the good news. Um, Tropy also is not a platform for writing your research. Um, so as as opposed to something like Devon Think, um, while it does allow you to take notes. Um, and attach them to your images, which is really, really helpful. You cannot use it to create any other kind of word processing document. Like you can export that either as a PDF or as a CSV file, like I was saying earlier, JSON, and then turn that into something. Uh, and, and it does have plugins that allows you to export. So that's where that would happen, right? In sort of a transformation of information um, through using a plugin. Entropy is not a platform for presenting your research. So in that same way, right, they're thinking you use this for the process of research and, and uh, development of your research, and then you export it into something like Omeka, for example. So it, again, it operates on your personal computer and not on a server, and you can then export it um, uh, as a project, right, in JSON or CSV or PDF and integrate, like, or even to Omega S. There is a particular uh, plugin that allows you to export to Omega S, which is really useful. And that's where you can create a sort of online presentation of your, your research materials. Um, so Tropy actually has a great video that explains their features already. And so I realized I didn't even have to redo this um, for you. You can watch it here. So I'm going to quickly just, I think we have enough time to quickly play that. Um, and then I'm just gonna note a few features and show you very quickly how this interacts with IIIF content, because that's the, we really wanna make sure that we're um, showcasing how IIIF connects with these types of image research uh, tools. You organize, describe, and manage your research photos. In this video, you'll learn how to get started using Tropy. When you open Tropy for the first time, it will prompt you to create a new project. 
we recommend creating one trophy project for your entire book manuscript or dissertation. This is Trophy's project view. To start working on your research photos, drag the image files directly into the item table here. Trophy accepts most image files, including JPEG, JPEG 2000, PNG, Hike, SVG, TIFF, and PDF. Trophy does not make copies of your images. It simply links to the existing files wherever they are saved on your hard drive. This means that nothing you do in Trophy will alter your research photos. So even if you delete or change a photo in Trophy, it will not affect the original. Once you've imported the photos, start adding metadata immediately to make sure you remember where they came from. To switch from list view to grid view and zoom in on the image thumbnails, use the slider on the top left of the screen. You can select multiple photos or select all and bulk edit the metadata on the right side of the screen in the metadata pane. Here you can record the archive, collection, and box or folder number. We now have metadata recorded for this entire group of photos, and we can add more item level metadata later on. You'll notice that there is a flag in the rights field to encourage you to fill in that information for every single item. Review the rights or permissions document you signed in the archive and enter that information here or you can add a link to the archive's rights policy. This is good research practice that will make things easier later on if you plan to publish your work. Now let's try out a few of Trophy's features. The first is the merge function. This is a multi-page document, which I would like to save as one item, not as six separate photos. To do this, select the images, right click, and select merge selected items. This is now one item containing multiple images within it. Next, Trophy allows you to edit or rotate multiple photos at once. As you can see, these remaining photos are all rotated to the left, which makes it difficult to read them. Select those images and right click, then select rotate right to rotate all of them together in one click. Double click on an item to move into item view where you can do photo editing, add additional metadata, and take notes on or transcribe your documents. In item view, Trophy includes basic tools to improve the legibility of your photos. Remember that this isn't changing anything about the original photos. You can rotate the photos or click on the advanced tools icon in the top right to adjust brightness, contrast, hue, saturation, or to sharpen or invert colors. You can zoom in on the image or fit the image to the page. You can also transcribe your document or take notes in the notes field below, or move the notes field so that it appears alongside the document. To add more item level metadata, use the metadata pane, which now appears on the left. Enter the document's title, creator, and the date using ISO format, beginning with the year, then the month, and then the day. If you'd like to pull out a small section of a photo, use the selection function. Highlight the selection and Trophy will generate a separate image within the item. This is particularly useful when working with newspapers or maps. Trophy allows you to create customized tags to organize your materials. In the tag pane, you can create a new tag or select an existing tag. These tags could be thematic. They might refer to places or people relevant to your research, or they might help you track your research process. For example, you could create a tag for items that have already been transcribed. Assign colors to your tags so that they can be quickly identified. You can create as many tags as you want in Trophy and you can assign items to as many tags as you'd like. Trophy also allows you to organize items into lists. We recommend using lists to create a chapter structure for your book, for example. 
or you could create thematic lists to keep track of all the items related to a certain topic. You can drag items into as many lists as you want and note that the items will still appear in your main item table. If you delete the list, the items will not be deleted. Now that you've seen how to get started using Trophy, review the documentation at docs.trophy.org to learn more. Thanks. Trophy is a tool that helps you organize. All right. So obviously that's a great little overview. Um, just to sort of briefly recap, because I know we're, we're running out of time, there's project view, right? And then there's item view. And I want to just quickly, while we have a, a few minutes here, um, give you a window into how this tool can be used um, really with a, a, um, a great collection here at UCLA, the Bonnie Cashin collection. So I'm just going to quickly demo that for you um, of how you can get started on a project in Tropy. Um, but there is a great amount of documentation and other video sets that I, I recommend you should take a look at. So you should be able to see the Bonnie Cashin collection here, right? And I can browse this incredible fashion theater and costume design collection. Um, and you can see just beautiful um, images, but also drawings, right? So this is a huge collection um, of an incredible material. And if I wanted to use Trophy, right? If I wanted to organize, get organized around uh, using or bringing these certain items into a, a more of an organizational structure, it's very, very easy by clicking into this particular item that I might be interested in, right? Thinking about the going to the whole image page here. And all I have to do, I have Tropy open. And if I click the advanced setting, you'll see when you first log into Tropy, it says standard or advanced. And if you use advanced, you can literally just drag things into uh, off the internet um, into Tropy to get started. Um, and so in this case, all I have to do is drag. You can see it lights up and I'm able to bring in that image quite quickly here into Tropy. I'm gonna make Tropy a little bit bigger so that you can see at home. So here's that image, right? And I can go in and start editing that data um oh giving me a there it goes i just needed a second to load it um so you can see i have now i have that um i moved from project view right to item view and in item view i can do a lot of work here to annotate um for instance i can use the selection feature and say i wanted to note something about the collar, right? Um, I'm able to make a selection, add a note, and you can see as soon as I made that selection, right, a selection, you know, got uh, automatically generated. I can say this is a collar, right? And add, and again, you have your sort of web features of how exactly you might want that to look in your notes. And you can continue to do that across the document, right? And as the more that I add, right, another selection comes up, I can annotate that. Maybe this is a sleeve, right? And then when I'm all that's getting stored along with that original image, so I'm able to make these annotations, store them, and then organize and export them when I'm ready for my, my final research project. So Trophy is a really powerful, open, uh, free platform. Again, it's different than some of what Chris showed today because it is a desktop um, platform, but it does have some of those really useful re um, functionality or functions that we're, we're looking for when we're doing image level research. Um, does anyone have any question? I, we're right at the, the end of our, our presentation time, but we're happy to, to stick around if anybody has any questions. Please. 
um, well, thank you all so much. And um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everyone.